Love it. Welcome, friends. Some of you have been here for a couple minutes, which we love. And I see some new friends joining, which is ever exciting. So excited to have you here for another episode of The Lunchroom. I think this is episode maybe 45 at this point, which feels staggering, but also very exciting. And we're so happy to be joined by some of our creative team members for Ocean Filibuster. I'm Sarah Schofield Manser. I use the she, her series of pronouns. I am ART's assistant director of special events and programming. I am a white woman with dark brown hair that's pulled up into a clip. I've got a blue corduroy sort of, uh, the, the kids call it a shacket, a shirt to jacket hybrid. And I'm feeling very, don't look my. I knew Mark was going to make that face, but I thought- New word for me. A new word. <laughs> Forever trying to age down, uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, Mark, I'm going to pass it for you to intro, and then we'll have Brenna go. I've got a little bit of housekeeping that I'll offer from Team ART before I hop off and let the conversation continue. Great. Hi, everyone. Happy Tuesday afternoon. Happy lunch. Um, I'm uh, Mark Lunsford. I take the He series of pronouns. I'm the artistic producer at the ART. Um, I'm a white man with a, a brown beard, close cropped brown hair. I'm wearing a sort of gray button down and a, a rose colored jacket. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Brenna. I use uh, she and they pronouns. Uh, I'm the education and engagement director here at ART, excited to be joining the dynamic duo of Sarah and Mark on the lunchroom. Um, and I am a, a white 30 something person. I have long dark hair that I pretty much always wear in a messy bun on the top of my head. Um, I'm in my apartment surrounded by plants and wearing a Heather gray sweater, not a shacket, not a blazer. Um, <laughs> you know. So happy to be here with you all. We're happy to have you, Brenda. So excited to have you. Always lovely to have fresh faces on the lunchroom. And you've been here before. So you're an old, you're an old pal for us. Uh, a couple bits of housekeeping before I again disappear. The first is that you will note that the chat is disabled. So you cannot communicate with us or our panelists via the chat. However, we do encourage you to submit questions using the QA feature that's at the very bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes of the hour to answer your questions. So feel free to submit at any point. Another little bit of Zoom technology, if you'd like to follow along with closed captions, you can turn on the Zoom auto-enabled captions. There should be a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, an icon that has three little dots in a row and says more. And depending on whether or not you have an updated version of Zoom, it should give you the option to show subtitle or show live transcript. So feel free to turn that on. It's not perfect because it is auto-generated by Zoom, but I do find it pretty helpful. A few other things, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement for both the theater and for myself. So the Little Drama Center sits on the um, unceded territory of the Massachusetts people, and I myself am calling in from the unceded territory of the Wabanaki, Penacook, and Pentucket peoples today in northern Massachusetts. Last, but absolutely certainly not least, I'd like to read the theater's anti-racism commitment statement, and that ART is unequivocally opposed to hate, and we center anti-racism as a core value. And we expect everyone in the ART community, including our audiences, to uphold these values. And as such, we do not tolerate anti-Blackness or racism of any kind in our buildings, nor at our online events. We aim to create an environment that is uninhabitable to racism and to discrimination where all BIPOC staff, artists, volunteers, audience, and community are seen, heard, valued, and provided the opportunity to thrive. This work is only possible when we do it together. So thank you for being our partner in it. Lovely. Great. And I am going to do what I do best every lunchroom and every virtual event. I'm going to disappear and be on the back end and allow the two of you to go off. So I will see you later if you need me. Uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you for joining us in another lunchroom. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. What do you think, Brenna? Should we kick it off? I think we should. I think it's time. All right. Let's invite our friends into the lunchroom. Lisa, Jen, and Katie, come on in. Hi, friends. Hello. Hi. Um, I pass it over to you to, to start, just to do some introductions for, um, for each of yourself. Um, Katie, I see you first. I might throw to you first. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Katie Pearl. I'm the director of the production and the co-artistic director of Pearl D'Amour, uh, along with Lisa. So I'm one of the co-creators co -creator, co of the piece. I use the She series of pronouns. I have lots of big, dark, curly hair, and I'm wearing a light brown sweater sitting next to a big window. I'm really glad to be here. 
passing it off to Lisa. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Damore. I'm the playwright for Ocean Filibuster and one of the co-artistic directors of Pearl Damore. I use the she series of pronouns. I am a white woman with long brown hair uh, and glasses wearing a black t-shirt. And I will pass it on to Jen. Hello, uh, my name is Jen. Uh, I go by she, they pronouns. Um, Oh, I'm one of the performers in the piece and I am uh, black and wear glasses and I'm sitting next to this plant, which is a, a life plant um, that we'll perhaps talk about a little bit later. It's very special to me. Um, I hope that that feels. Yeah, thank, thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, I also just want to mention we had, we had hoped to be joined with our dear, by our dear friend Skip Shirey today as well, um, the composer on the piece, but um, Skip has had some power issues very sadly. So um, he was not able to join us, but he's here with us in spirit and we're definitely going to um, be talking about his work on the production, which has been um, so, so key and critical and, and beautiful. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to start us on this one um, because the, there are so many things about this production that are incredibly important. Um, but one of the uh, most exciting parts about this production is it is the first project um, as part of our partnership with the Harvard University Center for the Environment um, that has reached production. Um, ART and Hughes have partnered to commission uh, many artists to begin um, theatrical treatments, um, writings uh, about the environment, about climate crisis. And Ocean Fieldbusters is the first to, to reach production, which is so exciting. Um, and so I wonder, you know, Katie and Lisa, if you could kind of take us way, 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 way back, because we all know we have been on a journey together um, through many twists and turns, um, to sort of the first contact about this commission, this commissioning program, and kind of what, what was coming up for the both of you first when you heard about this, um, this commission, the aim of this partnership, and what you all wanted to try to create inside of that. Sure. Uh, Katie, would you like me to start? Great. Um, we were really thrilled when ART and the and Hughes, the Harvard Center of the Environment, came to us with this opportunity um, for many reasons. Uh, you know, Pearl Damore has always created work that brings worlds together. So there was one show that we did, which took us on many, many, many trips to five towns named Milton to collaborate with these towns on a play kind of with the towns. Um, we did another kind of pretty large scale environmental piece called How to Build a Forest, which was an in-depth collaboration with a visual artist where we, the performance was building this fabricated forest on stage. Um, and when we do these projects, part of what we, what we love is that it, um, it often brings us outside of big cities. It brings us outside of the world of theater into like real life being lived in the moment, real problems being discussed in the moment. And we learn from um, experts in other fields, whether that is an expert because they have lived in a small town of 250 people for their entire 90 years, um, or, a, or an expert who is a, um, you know, an ocean scientist who has a lab at Harvard University. Um, so when, when we, we were like, wow, this is an amazing chance to kind of make what we make and collaborate with something that is completely outside of what we know. So, um, so we said, yes, of course, immediately. Um, and Katie, do you want to talk a little bit about how we started in terms of thinking about the ocean and who we met with? Sure. So we decided in a way, it was a little bit arbitrary on the ocean, Lisa. Wouldn't you say, like, we had worked on forests, we had worked in kind of civic-ish urban issues, and we thought, well, let's do the ocean. And also, Lisa uh, lives in New Orleans, so is really aware of the environmental issues around climate there. I live below sea level, like, not even joking. I yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we thought, well, this is a great opportunity, so let's do the ocean. What, whatever that means. And so we started by with a lunch uh, with maybe six 
scientists from Hughes that, um, Mark, I think you and the ART sort of put together a list of six people who all studied different aspects of the ocean. And at that point, we were a little bit like shopping for what was going to be our hook or our way in or what was the specific topic we were going for. So we were hearing about a lot of interesting things from them. And at one point during the lunch, we said, well, if, if there could be one thing that the audience, one message that the audience walked away with from this show about your work or about issues that have to do with the ocean, what would it be? And we expected them to say something like, you know, ocean acidification is a really big problem, or we really need to focus on, you know, X, Y, or Z. But instead we were met with kind of a prolonged pause and kind of puzzled, thoughtful faces And finally, one of them said, I don't know, wonder. And it was in that moment that we were like, oh, okay, we get it. We get it that what this piece is going to want to do and what we love to do so much is to create and think about the relationship between the audience and the and the content in this case, the ocean and how to create, as we began to think later or phrase it later, how do we create an intimate relationship with something that you will never be able to fully know or get to or understand? Um, And so that was sort of the beginning of our interest in like, okay, what is this connection between humans and ocean? Such a simple topic that I'm sure you were able to crack over the course of a weekend. (laughs) (laughs) Well, another thing, Brenna, that the scientists that sort of came out of that meeting was we started to realize that the way they were talking about the relationship, the sort of, um, yeah, the relationship between humans and the ocean over time is that the, the ocean has become it's almost like it, it's an enabler of the human race. So it, all the kind of bad behavior that, that the human race participates in, particularly since the industrial revolution, the ways that we're abusing the atmosphere and abusing the climate, the ocean has just absorbed and hidden from us for a really long time because it is so capable Uh, I mean, it's the system that regulates the planet. And as we have discovered over hundreds of years, that system is um, very adaptable and very deep and it can take a lot. But we are reaching a tipping point now where the ocean can no longer hide from us what our behavior is doing. And that is leading to the hurricanes and the sea level rise and the acidification and, and, um, And so when we started thinking about the ocean as an enabler and all the stuff we were pouring into it, Lisa at one point was like, well, what if the ocean got so fed up with us putting stuff into it? It just started like talking back and wouldn't stop until somebody actually listened. And so we, we kind of cast around for like, what are situations where somebody talks and talks and talks without stopping? And of course, a filibuster is one of them. So that kind of set us structurally on the idea of the framework of the piece. And you mentioned being in relationship with the ocean over a long period of time. And I know all of you have been in relationship with this play over a relatively long period of time. Uh, Now that we kind of have the baseline of where the ideas initially took you, um, and Jen would love to include you in this as well, since you've been involved in a few iterations too. Um, How has your approach, how has the production itself changed over time, um, over the time that you've been working on it, uh, both in terms of your own process the COVID life that we're living, um, and in terms of of how our uh, relationship and issues that have come up uh, related to ocean science uh, have changed over the time that you've worked. So what's changed? Um, uh, Well, I'll just speak personally. Um, I've, I've been with the project not as long as Katie and Lisa, but for a while, like you say, Brenna. And, you know, I grew up next to a a body of water that feels like, that I really identify with, which is the Chesapeake Bay. Um, And, you know, just grew up feeling really, like I've never lived in a place that's not near 
water and have always felt really like game and comforted by being in it in a way. And over the course, I was just thinking to myself that, you know, when you're like swimming in either the ocean or a bay, you know, like in, especially in a place that's not a pool, uh, you can, you can have a tendency to close your eyes when you're under the water and not really see what's Mm -hmm. there. I do try to keep my eyes open even in the, in the ocean, but you know, there are other things that are coming up that are obstructing your view. Uh, so the experience is like somatic with these like little glimpses of, of other things. And over the course of the development of this piece and thanks to you all, um, I got to, to go scuba diving for the first time And, you know, I had like tried snorkeling before and it didn't fit the, you know, I'm not somebody that naturally takes to breathing underwater. So this is a a whole process. So with you. (laughs) So with you. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. Well, we can have that discussion later, but it's like tied into birth, I think, you know, like that moment when you were like outside of the uterus, you know, which is connected to our evolution as human beings, that moment of like stepping outside of that body. So there's something about re-entering it that is like this thing that Katie brings up about wonder, a moment of of being able to be back in and sort of um, contend with like a different part of your like memory, Um, like maybe like an ancestral memory is really, really intensely powerful. And I have so many just like memories of what I was able to witness while like diving and while snorkeling as well. Just like watching like sunlight on grass in water, Mm. which is like watching sunlight on grass in air. And just thinking about how I had experienced like above water and below water as two different things and just understanding like, oh, it's really the same. It's just like a difference of pressure. Um, And experiencing like movement, like the movement that like I have access to and other beings have access to, how devastating it is to see like a cup reading Coke on the bottom of that, like, it's like embarrassing um, to see the ways that we like allow ourselves to impose, even in places where like, we, we can't really be without help. Um, you know, I don't really remember the question. Oh, it was about like how things have changed. So yeah, I think, uh, I think, being invited, like feeling invited by, by like sea beings to like witness what is going on. Um, I feel that that's like allowed me to have a different relationship to like, uh, land beings and a lot of gratitude and wonder, um, profound gratitude for what these other lives do. Um, so we can keep (laughs) <laughs> doing the same bullshit and just like really wanting to to change my behavior to honor what like these other beings are doing on on our behalf like Katie and Lisa were saying the ocean as enabler so at what point do I change my my behavior so that I'm not relying on that but instead like trying to be with it oh and this plant uh, is from the scuba trip. <laughs> I got some leaf cuttings and they've grown. There's a whole other one too. Um, just a little reminder, uh, you know, if you, if it, like, I'm like, how can I care for these things? You know, it's a little, little extra legal reminder to stay in a uh, right relationship with the planet. And those are just like cuttings you made while you were diving. 
Well, they're not. No, 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 no. We we went to a farmer's market. Lisa and I, when Lisa was down there as well, Mm -hmm. went to a farmer's market and somebody was selling plants. The sister was selling plants. And uh, you can't bring plants back because we were in St. Croix. So she hooked me up with some leaf cuttings, but they they have survived and I, I think are thriving here. So. Uh, yes, that was a great moment when you got those cuttings. Uh, I, I'd like to chime in and just quickly about how things have changed and how things will continue to change. Um, it's just wild. You know, a lot of companies like Pearl Demore that do collaborative work, interdisciplinary work, devised work, um, take several years to make a show. Um, because we're kind of finding our way. We're understanding how it fits together. We're trying to find a new form. So it's different than just, well, even writing a play sometimes can take several years, but anyway, so we knew this was going to take several years. Right. Um, and what we didn't realize is like how much the climate conversation was going to heat up during those years, just the years pre pandemic. Then we were delayed because of the pandemic. We were supposed to to premiere with you guys in September of 2020 and the, um, upheaval and uprisings around racial justice and climate justice, that kind of intersectional conversation, you know, just brought so many things, you know, into the public vocabulary about what was going on. Um, So it was, it was wild kind of having to allow our piece to meet that moment. And I think, I think, uh, I think that as the piece grew, not only were we committed to like, really letting audiences know some things about the ocean that they simply probably didn't know, but also to really think about human ocean and even cultural political systems um, that are, that are arguably out of balance right now and lead to things like environmental racism, lead to things like um, countries and communities of color kind of bearing the brunt of a climate crisis that they did not necessarily create those are really huge issues. So trying to figure out, but, but they're all like interconnected. And so, you know, I, I, I think trying to figure out how to open up space for that conversation in our show that was already jam packed with information um, was, took many, many kind of drafts and different calibrations and conversations with you all, with Jen, with our performers. uh, And also we are in this, evolving situation and we are touring this show starting this month through 2024. It's going to continue to evolve. So we have to keep our antenna up as we tour from place to place and evolve the show from place to place as much as we can. So it's, it's wild. It can be scary and overwhelming, uh, but also keeps you in the moment, which is what you want to be as an artist, why you make art, right? To kind of be in the moment and try and help yourself and others see it. I, I'm struck with something that you're all kind of naming and, and it's bringing up um, spirituality for me actually in an interesting way because, you know, Diane has talked often about how theater is the spiritual thing that happens between the audience and the artists when the performance is taking place, right? Um, and it's sort of defined theater that as that. And this piece is so highly theatrical but also in this conversation about wonder in the ocean um, and Jen, some of the things that you're reading about this trip, there's this like spirituality about this piece that I think is also deeply rooted in, in its, in its um, conception. And I wonder if, um, you know, both in, in the framing of the piece, you can talk a little bit about, um, and and it shows up in the play very specifically in in the, in the final 10 or 15 minutes, right. Um, Between Mr. Majority and the ocean. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about kind of that, that way in which theater allows this wondrous exploration of the ocean. And then particularly for you, Jen, balancing these two characters who are sort of grappling with that interconnectedness, what that was like for you in preparation to both relay a lot of really important information about the ocean, which is already a tough um, charge in and of itself, but to also grab this kind of very theatrical, very spiritual connection between those two characters all in in your one body. Well, what's coming up for me when you were saying that, Mark, is um, I don't remember when this was, but I just had this moment during a work period 
where I was like, oh, I see. This is a, this is the performance of an internal struggle. And I think like really like this moment that we're, we're at, you know, um, I, I'm like, sorry, there's like so much that I'm thinking about. Like we've somehow evolved to a, a place where we have to make a choice about like, I mean, speaking of spirituality, like what are we, like, what's the point, right? Like literally at a kind of existential crisis, like what is the point of being here? Is the point to win or is the point that we're just here? Um, and, you know, I feel pretty clear, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think that it's winning. And I think that that's like really what's at stake for this like one body, like the, the one body that's encapsulating this. Um, there's an invitation to consider a, an entirely different project for existence besides domination and conquering and winning. And I, I feel like that's like the, the nucleus of our <laughs> greatest problem. And to this point about wonder, it, it kind of makes me say like, you know, if you just accept, like if we could just accept like, okay, like a, a loss or failure, doesn't wonder get to creep in? Like, don't we get to enjoy that a little bit more? Don't we get to engage with that a little bit more? If, if I have accepted, I might not be the most wondrous, you know, at the table even. Um, and so I think it's important for that to happen in one being. I, I think it, it's like really significant. It's felt significant for me to, to, to see like, well, oh, like, uh, what are the instances in your life, Jen, where you haven't put down a need to dominate? How are you trying to control? I mean, it's like funny to be like super proud of this project and also be like, well, you know, this as a plant, like could do just fine on its own. Like it was good where it was, you know what I'm saying? This is a selfish project in and of itself. I'm like, thank you for your service. You, you know what I mean? Right. Um, so yeah, like speaking of evolution and change and, and this thing of like, uh, yeah. I wonder, I hope, that certainly by the end of the piece, but I think that there, there are all of these moments before then where we, we can ask ourselves like, what is my attachment to time? Why, why is it, why is my uh, answer to a problem like I can fix it as opposed to like, let me be in relationship to that. Let me consider like where I am in relationship to that thing. Um, What's my relationship to like humility and like, how does that sit on my person? Once again, I've kind of lost the thread. But. No, I think you're right there. I think, you know, Cause it's, it is that like, um, I, I, don't, I don't think we are conditioned to like consider spirituality and our connection to the planet often, right? It, it gets wrapped up in sort of larger religious concepts and it is not sort of in the way that this production suggests to us that, that that's actually. Uh, yeah, I think that there are humans, there, there are certainly spiritual uh, traditions that are actually like focused at, uh, outside of the cell, but we're in this like humanist context, you know, like, you know, <laughs> work like especially in this country, no matter where you're coming from, like you, you are you are either like serving this like anthropomorphized deity or you're trying to figure out how to exist around it. You know, you're being like tossed around by everybody's like emphasis on this thing. And it's no wonder that like we're like bowing down to an image of ourselves and, and, and we have all these problems. Well, and I think too that, you know, 
theater, when you come see a play, you're, you're trying to have some kind of communal experience, right? Of course. And, um, uh, you know, the ocean as, as embodied in our show be- begins played by Jen, but then is played by six other people as well, kind of pointing to like, no, what, what's the quote now? It's like a cliche quote. We contain multitudes, you know, uh, that like we, we no no one is just one person and, and no one can really operate solo outside of a community. I mean, I think that we trick ourselves into thinking that. Um, and so I, you know, we, we, uh, you know, th- this is the first, this is the first um, production of this play. Um, every I've, I've had many plays produced and every one of them, the ending has evolved from production to production, right? So we'll see how this ending evolves, but we chose this ending to have the audience hung together, right? Which is like, hopefully not too scary because you're behind your mask, but it is this like feeling of like literally the sound waves coming out of our mouths, like blending. And I, I do feel, you know, spiritual or not, you know, we are at a moment where we've got to reach it. We've got to learn how to reach out <laughs> to each other. There's just like, I, I, I think it's, we're just going to really move towards collapse. If we just keep trying to like have our one car, our one house, our one, you know, never ask anyone for help you know, the way we've been doing it. I just don't know how much longer we can go down that road and survive as humans or just survive as a, as a, you know, biological part of this planet. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, how does that like, we, we take these concepts and try to think of how to like reflect them on the stage. I wonder how that started to really impact your vision for like what this physical production was going to look like and how this was going to show up in the, in the relationship that performers were going to have to the audience. Yeah. Well, we, we knew off the bat that we were really excited about using really theatrical storytelling tools to help convey all this information in part because we we wanted to convey information we wanted people to actually learn things from this show and we knew that um it couldn't all happen just from jen speaking and so this vision of really using projections um oh we had a great talk with a, a scholar a theater environmental a um, scholar named Yuna Chowdhury, who teaches at NYU. And Yuna is really interested in interspecies communication. And um, she's developed a, a way of thinking about making art called climate lens, which is basically saying you cannot look at anything outside of the lens of climate. Like that's, that's, that's the only window we can see things through at this point in humanity. And um, she really encouraged us in an early draft to um, to honor and privilege and respect the wisdom that comes from myth and fantasy. And that hard fact was not the only way to translate information. And that was a little opening for us to let the piece kind of grow in different ways. So, so I started out talking about projection. One of the things that pro- really immersive projection can do is work on work on us through um, and, and through our imaginations. And Tal Yarden, our projection designer, very early on, really advocated for underwater imagery to not be sort of National Geographic, um, pristine photographic. That he felt like we were so used to seeing those images that if we were to use more animation, more evocative. Um, abstract imagery that would help the audience form this relationship. So um, the projections were a part of that, this amazing music by Skip Shirey. So as Mr. Majority and Ocean, the two characters kind of try to convince each other and the audience, the Senate, towards their particular perspectives, they occasionally use songs to expand on their points or um, explicate or draw us deeper in. And each of those songs, um, we, call, we, we often call this a genre crashing musical. Like each song has its own flavor and its own genre to really like enter into us in a very particular way. So for example, there's a part of the show where 
both Mr. Majority and O are talking about phytoplankton very passionately. And um, Mr. Majority is talking about like all the work that this phytoplankton can do and we're gonna like claim it and grow it and capitalize on it. And, and O is like, starts singing this very beautiful song about just the beauty of phytoplankton. And if we just step back and like be with how beautiful they are, um, and so in that moment, the music and the projections are really working together to expand the story. And then the moment that Lisa just referred to where the audience hums at the end, we also felt like we wanted the theatricality of the show to, to really move to such an extreme that at the end, Jen can just like clap her hands and, and the theatrical world drains away and it can just be Jen and the audience and the members of the choir as their human selves being together saying like, okay, so this is where we are sitting in this theater now. What are we gonna do about that? How are we gonna be together? How can we be with all these things we just mentioned? I think thinking about those crossing of boundaries, I was actually going to point out the same moment, Katie, the phytoplankton song. That's one of my favorite parts of the show um, where I felt very connected. Um, and you alluded to this when talking about some of the other work that Pearl Demore has done as well, but um, expanding what we would say at ART beyond the bound, expanding the boundaries of theater. Sometimes that means beyond the form. Sometimes that means beyond the literal walls. Um, and for this production, we've been able to collaborate on um, some really cool interactive lab stations <laughs> that accompany the play. Uh, and I'm wondering if you'd like to just talk a little bit about um, how those projects came to be. We can also talk about our partnership with the Conservation Law Foundation um, and why you thought that that was an important piece um, of the creative project, not just something that's in conversation or outside of it. Yes, um, I'll start and then Lisa, you can you can dive in. It, it, on one hand, it sort of goes back to this wealth of information that we were getting from these scientists. And as we were working on early drafts of the play, we kept knowing that like we had to take this chunk of information out or this was too much, like the play just couldn't hold it. And um, we also were thinking about the different ways that people can learn and experience and take things in. So after sitting and listening to a performer talk at them for a while, we thought, well, what are the ways that people can have an embodied experience to learn some of these concepts too? And when the ocean choir comes in, it's at a point in the play where, where, oh, where ocean we call, oh, is feeling like I cannot communicate with just this voice. Like I, I am not, a, I am a multiplicity. The ocean is a multiplicity. And, um, and so when the choir comes in, the, one of the reasons we brought them in is so that as the intermission happens, they can be carrying on this sort of information experience through these mini labs um, with the audience. Um, Lisa, do you want to talk about each one or specifically Arcad? Uh, well, maybe I can, maybe I can uh, uh, come up with like one example, but I also was thinking about um, in terms of how the pieces changed, this is maybe the section of the play that was forced to change the most because mm, of COVID. Yeah. And, um, and I actually, I, I think it's so awesome what we did at ART, um, but I sometimes feel like it's just a little dramaturgical like twist because we couldn't, we couldn't flow in the way we wanted to flow because the these amazing creatures with coral heads are, are supposed to be out in the lobby, you know, kind of putting people's minds into different places of their body. And the cod's supposed to be sitting in a chair in the lobby answering questions. And so it's, it's very like the ocean is, um, the feeling is that, oh, oh, the character, oh, needed to get somatic, needed to get embodied, needed to convey in a different way. And so kind of rallied these troops, right? To, and there was these lines that we kind of had to take out for a number of reasons where when each experiment starts, the coral headed person says something like, um, okay, give me my hand. Oh, wait, I mean, give me your hand. Uh, sorry, sometimes I, I just got confused as to who was you and who was me. And like, this is like kind of one of the through lines of the show is like, where does ocean end and we begin? 
So, um, so we're super excited to kind of um, explore that. And as we continue to tour the show, because fingers crossed, it seems like we're entering a manageable stage of our relationship with COVID. Um, so, so we were, and, and I do think that we were definitely thinking about how do we keep people engaged and wanting to learn more and not being talked at the whole time. Um, and, you know, like, I love the fact that an octopus's brain exists kind of all over its body, um, which like, it makes me imagine like, oh, when am I caught in my head? When am I not feeling things about the environment that I should be feeling, right? So I think it's just like another way of trying to trick the audience in a friendly way, um, how to be engaged with this, this conversation and this topic. Yeah, and I would say part of the ethos of the project is about the relationships with each community we we do the show in. And so here in Cambridge, oh, so this the intermission stations give us the opportunity to have a deeper collaboration with an advocacy group, an environmental advocacy group in each place and dream with them about what kind of creative experience we could give the audience that activates their own work and promotes their own work. And so here in Cambridge, um, we worked with the Conservation Law Fund. We were really inspired by a comic strip that they have done in the past about called The Real Fishwives of Cassius Ledge, which is a, um, a, a habitat for cod that needs protections. And so we kind of spun off that and created this per, this character based on that comic strip that does a, a, a drag act and and um, ha- asks that people in the audience to scan a QR code and sign a petition and, and teaches a lot. And so when we go to Houston, we're working with several environmental groups down there to um, talk about issues there. And every place we go, we'll take the time to really build that relationship and create an experience. I think it's really extraordinary and our partners at Conservation Law Foundation would echo like, I don't know that any of us expected to be in a room with a bunch of artists and a bunch of um, climate lawyers and activists and the result would be a drag cod, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it was so lovely to see that come to fruition. Um, we do have a question, I think in the Q and A uh, related to, I, I would summarize it as why theater? What can theater do um, that other forms can't? Or um, what, what can theater do to advance um, activism and topics of environmental justice, as you've been talking about? And perhaps it's not a definitive answer. Perhaps there's multiple <laughs> layers of... Yeah, I'm going to list, to yeah. I'll, I'll list a couple of things that I hope are true. And, uh, and then I, I'm going to actually have to duck out of this awesome conversation just a little early for a, another Zoom meeting. But, um, uh, you know, I hope that theater can bring together people who live in the same area, who are dealing with the same issues. Uh, even at a theater as big as ART, I think you run into people that you work with, that you live near. Um, and so, you know, you're having this embodied experience together and, you know, in our show, you know, you're also taught, you also learn, if I talk about our show specifically, you learn about an area in the water near your home, Cassius Ledge that needs some attention, right? So, so with this show, I think we're hoping to give people both a wide view and a zoom in to their local issues. Um, I also just think... You know, I love, um, I love that, like, I think, I think audiences talk about plays in theater differently than like the way they talk about the miniseries, the dropout that they just saw, you know, like, I think you talk about it differently because I think that like, you're in it, you're in the room, you may miss something that you're confused about and have to ask someone, like, did you see it that way too? Like, it's just, it's, there's so many different kinds of experiences that people have when they're sitting in that theater that I think that the, that you talk about it in a different way after, which I think um, may increase the chances of continuing to have that conversation like long after the play is over. So those are two thoughts. Katie or Jen, do you have any? I can add in something. Um, I want to read you actually something that came up. I'm te- I teach at Wesleyan University and I'm teaching a class in site-specific theater. 
And I was talking with my students about an essay by an Australian scholar named Gay McCauley about why um, embodied performance is important and being a, a spectator um, is important. And one of the things she says is the power of performance as an expressive practice for both performers and spectators alike is that it produces more lived experience rather than images or artifacts. And in the society of the simulacrum, the society of spin where countries can be manipulated into going to war on the basis of doctored evidence, it is such lived experience that might just might make a difference. And so I just wanted to offer that as theater being like why theater? Because it's a lived experience that we're taking in with our whole bodies in community with people sharing a lived experience that somebody like Jen is going through on the stage. And Jen is clearly going through a real experience when they are performing that show. And um, so we can't kind of put it to the side, you know, it's not just another ad or image or piece of propaganda. Uh, and I, I like plus one, everything Kenny and Lisa just said. And also like, if this, this COVID moment has taught us, you know I mean? Like lots of things, but um, we, we're experiencing the, we have experienced the loss of being like connected in real time and space. Um, so now like maybe those opportunities become even juicier and we get to like interact with, with them as possibilities, with these possibilities and with each other in a, in a different way. So we now understand what it's like to be bereft of that. Um, thank you guys so much. I'm going to um, bop over to my meeting with the black and blue story project in new Orleans. And, uh, Thank you so much, Mark and Brenna. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah. I, I kind of want to keep pulling on, on that part of the conversation because I think one of the one of the really great things about the piece, um, again, I, you people have heard me say this on lunchrooms before, right? Like we we are all members of of a practice that at the beginning of this pandemic was deemed non-essential. And then I think as we, uh, I think Lisa said it, um, sort of are, are reevaluating our, our relationship to COVID <clears throat> into a more manageable area, it strikes me that it suddenly brings theater and performance to a very essential place. Um, you were kind of mentioning this too, Jen, like that we've been so isolated from one another that this, this act of kind of communion <clears throat> and being in the space together to bear this sort of collective witness to storytelling is going to be really important. And this piece really goes there because it is so highly theatrical and it is not just, I think folks could be um, fooled into thinking it's this kind of schoolhouse rock episode about the ocean, right? But there's so much, there's so many other layers. There's huge amounts of comedy. There's huge amounts of drama. There's, um, you know, gigantic visuals, music. We've mentioned it already with this genre crashing bit. So it, it's kind of, to me, in a lot of ways, the answer to where we need to be coming out of this long period of isolation um, to facilitate this kind of conversation. And, and theater has a real chance to do that. Yeah, I think I'm really understanding what I have been told all my life, which is that meaning can't happen without stories to hold, hold that meaning and take it in. And like the headlines and the and the climate reports that we're getting all the time are sort of horrifying and scary. And then they kind of stop in my brain and my body because I don't know how to metabolize them or I don't know how to be in relationship to it or do anything about it. And I think my hope is that when people come see this play and if, you know, whoever they come with, their families, there's so, so many kids coming to see, there's so many families coming to see this show that it gives us a way to really talk about these issues. And there's, because there's, we can hold it now. Like there are these two characters arguing about it or like, what about what they said in this piece? Or what about that image or that song when the ocean says, I don't care about you. Like, what is that, you know? So I like it that it gives people little handles and handholds to start to, to be in relationship to this massive topic.
topic. Jen, I don't know if you remember a conversation that you and I had uh, a long time ago, um, but we were, it was when we had finally sort of settled like, okay, now we think we know when we're going to do Ocean Filibuster and we were getting excited. And I had mentioned to you, I was like, I just don't want to see the plays about COVID. Like, I hope no one's making plays about COVID. I don't. And, and you had said that the only play I want to make about COVID is a play where we all go to the town square and play with puppies. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. A puppy pile piece. It's still a dream, Mark. And I, I think it might be happening later this year. It's not <laughs> called a puppy pile piece. But I think I think my antidote to rampant patriarchy is like, let's just touch each other for a little bit. We were, this is true. We were we were in a, having a meeting about this piece last night, my collaborators and I. <laughs> we were like, how do you like kiss people on the back of their knees just so they bend a little bit? And then we're talking about like, and I think this is related to Ocean Filibuster. It's like, you know, all part of the same project, but like, how do we encourage supplication? Oh, I remember that. Oh yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite combos of, of 2020 for sure. <laughs> um, what's next? You know, Lisa talked about there's a, there's a, you know, uh, path all the way through 2024. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, where we're headed next? And sure. That? Yes, it's coming up very soon. So <laughs> our 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 final performance at the ART is on Sunday, and then we pack up all the props and costumes and ship it to the University of Houston. And the following. Wednesday, the team goes to Houston, Jen arrives the following Monday, and then we tech the show and have our first touring performance at the University of Houston. And we're already starting to work. So Jen and one other performer, Evan, will be traveling with the show and then we'll locally cast the choir, the Ocean Choir. So, uh, so we're going to Houston soon and then in the fall we'll be in Miami, which is a, a place we're really excited to be in collaboration with. In the following spring, we'll be heading back to the Northeast and hopefully doing a whole um, sequence of universities. I think we're really interested in how the show lives and as an opportunity for university presenters in many departments to, to be able to get involved and enter the conversation through their own doorway. We're hoping to get it out to Utah, some places in California, so yeah, there's some plans going throughout 2024 and, and we'll see how it evolves. I really love the idea of Utah because it's so, <laughs> it's like so interesting to me because it's like, you know, landlocked. I mean, yeah. obviously there's like a mini ocean there, but, uh, and then there are so many um, moments when I'm, I'm personally like thinking and like imagining what I've seen in Utah specifically, like in that like bottom of the aquarium kind of like, oh, you see the evidence of having been at the bottom of the ocean. Well, that, and you know what that makes me think of in one of Mr. Majority's first songs, he says like, well, when we, when we put the solution into place and, and pull the seas in and expose all the land, you'll be able to go rock climbing on the Great Barrier Reef. Like, won't that be great? And that's what Utah's like. All of those rock formations and all of that at one point was underwater. And, um, and here we are. But it's also fascinating to think about going around the country with this show, because, for example, when we bring it to, let's say, Middletown, Connecticut, where I am, we're not by the ocean, but we're right on the Connecticut River. And so to be able to even assert in this piece that to create a station about Connecticut, the Connecticut River issues and be able to assert that that's the same thing as talking about ocean issues, because it is the same thing. But we tend to not think about that. I think that's really important or in a very inland place where we're just talking about air quality and pollution. It's also an ocean issue and, and to, and to assert that connection feels exciting. I'm glad you talked about that, Katie, because we've even been in conversation around, you know, the tour stops that you have set 
our um, coastal communities. Jen, I also grew up along the coast. Um, and being from Utah or Colorado or somewhere else that's more landlocked. Uh, when you said Utah, I imagined this play happening on the top of a mountain. And I thought that would be so cool. So hopefully yeah. it will happen. Um, but I, I'm, I'm curious just in the, in the last couple of minutes before we give you a, you know, a send off question to get people's minds buzzing, like what, what would be the importance in your minds of bringing this somewhere that's not coastal? To, I think uh, that thing of, of being able to understand that just because the, you know, something in your life has put you in like one place, it doesn't mean that you're not connected to another place. Um, and to, to, to be able to engage with these like places that we call landlocked places. I mean, we, only, we say Utah is landlocked because we've imposed borders around Utah. And so we've created Utah, but it's not more or less landlocked than any other place. We also say it in the show in so many different ways. Like at one point, Ocean says, you know, the boundaries of the Senate chamber, the walls, this is a dangerous fiction, this idea of separation. And later the Ocean is like, hey, rich people, you think that you're, you know, you're living in your homes with your eco-friendly air purifiers, but you are still downwind of the spew that is coming out of the oil refineries and the delivery trucks. Like, borders, walls, it, it's a fiction. We're all completely connected and are impacted by, by everything. So I would say that would be one reason. Should we bring it home, Mark? Yes. I'm, I'm yes. excited for this question, Rena. Yes, yes. Um, I think this is inspi inspired by something that came into the Q&A, um, asking about a favorite ocean fact, um, which we could do that, though. I'm also curious to hear if there was anything particularly um, resonant or surprising that you learned through working on this project uh, that you'd like to share out as a last thought. For me, I, I did not know that 50% of the air we breathe comes from the ocean. So that's something that I'm taking away. And then tag on your favorite ocean creature. Oh yeah, um, I really That's like that. <laughs> I really like a jellyfish. Not, to, I don't want to spend time with a jellyfish, but like the I have memories of the aquarium experience where they have the blue light in the jellyfish room, and they just look like glowing, globular, amazing monsters, and they're my, they're one of my favorites. Um, I'm going to say. I didn't know that phytoplankton like rose up to the surface during the day to find the sunlight and go back down to darker parts at night. Like phytoplankton have a clock um, that they regulate. And that for some reason really struck me the day I learned that. Um, and my favorite ocean creature right now well, I said this the other day too. It has to be the, well, no, I'm going to change it. There are these um, crabs called Hadel, no, Hadel crabs, Yeti crabs. They're called Yeti crabs. And they live on those hydrothermal, thermohydral vents on the ocean floor. And they live in these extreme temperatures that's like boiling, boiling, beyond boiling hot uh, water coming out of the vent and beyond cold, freezing water as well so like they're they they live in these extreme environments they have big hairy arms uh well, did you want to say something more i love puffer fish that's always been my 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 ocean wonder i think they're the coolest things <laughs> uh i don't know if i have a favorite fun fact um but i will say that I love watching like any rays move. Um, and I will never forget what happened to my soul when like I got to see an, oct I got to watch an octopus change. Uh, and I think that that really was like a turning point in my life. But These videos of like octopi 
squeezing through these like crevices and boats to escape are insane. It's so insane. And it's so humbling to be like, I don't, I can't even conceive of the kind of intelligence or what is happening for that creature to understand so much about their environment and then to be able to like be in response to it in that way. Uh, Like that's really humbling. I think that's a great way to take us out. (laughs) Shout out to the cephalopods. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Nerd alert. Brenna's coffee cup. Brenna's coffee cup. (laughs) Yeah, I have a squid on my coffee cup. (laughs) Um, Thank you all so much for for joining us in the lunchroom. This is such a fun conversation. Um, I think highlights, you know, this piece is talking about a lot of really important stuff, but it's also very fun. It's a very fun experience. We've had fun. We definitely had fun. Thank you for having us. All right. And if you haven't got your tickets yet, please join us at the Lobe. We're running to Sunday. We'd love to have you. Like I said, it's a total blast. Bring the whole family. You'll have a whale of a time. I didn't even really mean to make that pun. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it just emerged, I promise. And the show will be streaming for another week after that, too, if anybody needs digital access to it. Thanks, right. everybody. Thanks, friends. Thank you. Bye. Have a great show tonight, Jen. Thank you. Yes.